So, it's worth remembering then that Paul is uh, speaking to us today from Philippians 2.17. And it's worth remembering that as Paul speaks, he is in jail. Okay? He is in jail. He's suffering for his Christian faith, for his ministry, for his service to God. He's in jail, he's in Rome, he's awaiting trial. And we know a little bit about Rome at the time. We know that Rome at that time was under the, the rule of a lot of very, very hostile sort of emperors. We know that Nero was in Rome. Okay? Nero is the guy who was particularly down on Christians. Uh, certainly after he caused his fire. We don't quite know the dating. There's debate about the dating as to which imprisonment this is, but, but there you go. He's in jail, he's in Rome, he's awaiting trial, and his life is in question. What's going to happen? The jail wasn't comfy. Jail wasn't very pleasant. Jail was pretty unpleasant. Uh, it was a hard place to be, it was a hard experience to have. Mm -hmm. And he's there, waiting to know whether well, they're going to kill him for following Jesus. And there are always those guys up in Jerusalem, big churches, big opportunities for ministry, proper remuneration for their tasks, meeting the needs of those Jerusalem apostles, their wives, their families. And here's Paul, squeezed. Paul is squeezed. We don't know what ever became of Paul's wife under the pressure of him becoming a Christian and setting up as a Christian preacher. We don't know what happened to her. She disappeared off the scene. We do know that he is a man who knows shipwrecks, and he knows imprisonment, and he knows beatings, even being stoned and left for dead because he loved Jesus and was going to follow him. We know Paul was a man who had been from a wealthy background and he needed to learn to do without as well as to have had. And why was he subject to those trials? And why was he subject to those hardships? And why was he subject to those sufferings? It's a real question. You can talk to me if you want it. <laughs> because he was following Jesus. He got comfortable as a Pharisee. But for the fact <clears throat> that he was living a lie. He was living an empty lie. With a great outward appearance. But a heart in defiance of God. And God spoke to him about it, and God dealt with him about it. And from then on, everything was great, except people kept picking on him. And he never had enough of anything. And he was always squeezed for following Jesus. Somebody told me a story two or three weeks ago when it went on something like this. Brother Andrew, you've heard of Brother Andrew? Brother Andrew was a missionary. It says little about his background before that because of the work he was doing. He's given his life to serving and supporting, supporting persecuted Christians all over the world. Firstly in you know, the east of Europe, and then, well, at the moment he's doing a lot in Afghanistan. Here's a guy who goes into sort of uh, religious schools and closed Muslim countries, and he's invited to come and speak to them about what Christianity is about, so they know. Here's a guy who appears to have been baptising them in their tens and their twenties following such events. He's given his life to that sort of work. So he's lived out his life not quite knowing when his commitment to Christ is going to cost him his life. He's lived daily amongst people who are regularly called to undergo seven shades of suffering for the sake of Christ and the Gospel. And the word went out that uh, he, was, he was going to pop up at a big Christian conference, so everybody's there. And he's going to be speaking at the evening meeting. So that the evening meeting, the big auditorium, was packed, jam-packed, even full of people. Can you imagine? It would be, wouldn't it? And, and of course the band comes on. The band does the big old work up, you know, fantastic dynamic worship stuff. And, you know, great, like we have here. Not like we have here. Um, <laughs> great big, you know, fuss is made and whatnot. And he's coming to speak. Do the preach. And there's really quite a buzz in the place. And he stands up and he opens his Bible, this grey-haired little old guy. As he now is. And he read from the passage of scripture where Jesus teaches his followers that those who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. And then he closed up his Bible, looked out at the expectant congregation and said, so what is the matter with you people? And quietly left the building. We're starting a series on the problem of pain and suffering and how Christians can meet that challenge if they have a mind to. But as we do so, we're listening to people who bank on 
the fact that following Jesus is going to mean for us what following Jesus meant for Je being Jesus meant for Jesus. Does that make sense? So as we're listening to Paul, he's not speaking to us as a 20th century Western um, you know, Christian in the comfortable surroundings of myself with Paul, right? He's speaking to us as a guy who knew what it was like to follow Christ and put his life on the line. See the rugby yesterday? <laughs> there were these Italian guys who were struggling to, to deal with the Welsh forwards onslaught because there was a lot of rain about. You watched it, didn't you? Yeah, you? Were you forced to? No, I was watching You always watch it, excellent, well. It's, it's just, I expect Andrew was watching it, so I thought he went away from another choice, but great, that's cool. It was wet, wasn't it? It was a rough game. It was a forward dominated game. Everything was in the pack. It was physical, it was violent. And you see these poor, poor Italian guys sort of throwing themselves at the thing, putting their bodies on the line. These guys are prepared to put their body on the line, kicking a bag of wind around the park. Paul is the sort of guy talking to us today who's ready to put his body on the line and his life on the line. For the sake of Christ, not for the sake of eternity. So he speaks quite directly to us. He's in jail. He's putting his life on the line. He's putting his body on the line at the moment. He's been short of everything until the Philippians have just sent their recent gift. He's squeezed all the time. Squeezed has been the story of his life ever since he met Jesus. How do you feel about that? He's a man who'd known shipwrecks and imprisonment and beatings and stoning. We know he was a man who needed to learn to deal with these things. Being subject to these things, why? Why is Paul's ministry so unblessed? Is he in this situation because he's been unfaithful to God? Was it because he's been doing something wrong? See, that's the way our churches think. It's actually because he was doing something right. Was it because he'd lost God's blessing on his ministry? That's the way our churches think. Actually, no, it's not. It's because God's blessing really, really was on his ministry. And the whole Praetorian Guard knows that he's there for Christ. The elite crack troops of the empire. Guarding the emperor, at the heart of the empire. Know why he's there and what he's about. Is it because he's not in the place that God wants him to be, somehow having missed the plan or purpose of God for his life, for his ministry? Quite the reverse. See, there are dangers in coming under pressure as a Christian. Think of it like this. In Judaism, before Jesus, the idea was that anyone who was suffering, as Paul was now suffering, has caused displeasure to God, was under the judgment of God. That's the way they thought. That's the way they saw it. If you're not prospering, you're under God's judgment. Paul's not prospering. Not materially. But spiritually, it's quite different. Paul has come to see that this suffering is not God's condemnation, but God's authentication, his stamp of approval on people actually following Jesus. So we're looking at a series on this. We're looking at a series connected to what we do as Christians, what we go through as Christians, and how we deal with that. Because there's a Jesus. That's what it's about. So how does Paul see his situation then? How does he see this situation in his Roman jail? He says, I'm being pulled out like a drink offering. Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The Christian is saying, yeah, here's my worship to God. You see it being difficult for me to do this? You see it diff being difficult for me to follow Jesus in this way? Here's my worship. Now we all think in terms of worship as if it's singing. Don't we? It is. It is singing. Singing is a very important part. But that's not all the Bible means by worship, is it? The Bible sees worship as putting your life on the line, putting your body on the line, not just falling across a ball on a path, but putting your life on the line for, for following Jesus.